It's per 100,000. The national median is 156 per 100,000. And when you do the math, we're 56 officers below the national median for our city's population. So this results in overtime that is necessary to meet provincially re re legislated service standards. And more police will mean less dangerous driving, improved response times, and a safer Hamilton. We're going to increase patrols. At least we're going to see if council will approve a plan that will increase patrols. Many citizens feel unsafe in their own neighborhoods. Driven by an increase in careless and dangerous driving, petty theft, and violent crime. I know that living downtown, if, if I don't lock my car door, it'll be open in most cases. And those are called crimes of opportunity, and those crimes can be diminished somewhat by visible policing. The constant complaint from our suburbs is that they rarely see police patrolling their area while relying on neighborhood Facebook groups to try to protect their properties. So our plan is to promote a community policing approach with increased visibility of high risk and targeted areas, not only to deter crime, but as well to provide residents with a greater sense of protection and safety. Visible policing worked well in the downtown core in the past. I want to see this implemented throughout the city, its suburbs and rural areas. It was common in an earlier term to see yellow jacketed police officers walking the streets, visible policing on our streets. I'd like to see that return. We need to increase park and trail lighting and security. Hamilton's vast network of trails and parks are inadequately lit. That leaves many users to feel unsafe using them after dark. And this has to change. Installation of solar lights along our trail networks and in parks will help to deter crime and restore that sense of security that will allow Hamiltonians to fully enjoy our remarkable uh, green spaces, parks, and outdoor areas. We have something special in Hamilton, but we need to enjoy it in a safe manner. Proactive relationship building. Many communities feel a disconnect with the officers who are sworn to protect them. And one way to address this is to encourage positive interactions between the officers and the communities they serve. Well, the Hamilton Police Service has several units dedicated to this. As city officials, we need to take a more proactive role in building these bridges across our diverse community. Hamilton has failed to adequately fund the Hamilton Police Service, which leads to an unacceptable delay in implementing the body camera pilot project. Body cameras protect both officers, officers and the public and are an accountability tool for any modern police, uh, any modern police force. Hamilton needs to move more quickly toward equipping our officers with up-to-date technology. And officers that look like Hamilton, a modern police force needs to be reflective of the community that it serves. And it's up to us to reach out to highly qualified candidates and encourage them to consider a career in law enforcement. We will support Hamilton Police Service's ongoing effort to hire more officers who, as a force, will fully represent the diversity that is a source of pride for our city. These are the main items of the approach that I'm planning to take if I'm fortunate enough to be elected as the mayor of the city of Hamilton once again. I'd be happy to take any questions. So, Bob, you, how many officers are you, are you uh, planning on hiring? You know, would you like to hire? And how will you pay for them? Well, I, I think the, short, the shortfall has to be attacked incrementally. So I would think, and I, I believe Chief Bergen has talked about a nine-year plan to accommodate the, the growth in the force to the, the place it needs to be. You know, it's, we just don't have the money and resources right off the bat to do everything that's needed to be done all at once. But we need to set a horizon, a goal, and, and move toward it. And so the, that's the plan incrementally increase the force to the point where it, it meets our needs. Are you confident the public support is there for increased policing because there's, there's a, a 
segment of the population yeah, there's a segment of the population that has expressed discontent and with this notion of defunding. That is such a minority, in my experience, talking to people that I'm not even going to consider it. We, we are short by any measure of adequate policing, and the Police Act of Ontario says that adequate and effective policing is the requirement. And so we're going to move toward that standard. And I think that watching things like the sad funeral of, of the, the officer yesterday is, is an example of what needs to be done. We, we, we have to prevent, we have to attack crime before it happens as much as possible. And we can't do it without the proper resources. There may be a golden era in years from now when that won't be the case. Maybe there will be other kinds of surveillance. But right now, we need more boots on the ground, uniformed officers doing their job. And I, I intend to pursue that. So, so, for instance, in this police budget coming up, and any idea how many more officers? No, I don't know exactly how many. Uh, it was interesting. When I was on the police board the last time, uh, the council was insisting that we do not increase the budget. But the chief of the day, Chief DeCare, found a way to add I believe 15 officers, uh, which created this. I have to look that up again, but I remember there was some furor about that. Well, where did he get this? Well, we worked it out in the budget. And so um, that's something that we'll sit down with uh, on the board as a council and, and move forward with it. But it will be a priority for me. Would you hope to be, as mayor, would you hope to be a chair of the board, as Mayor Eisenberger has said? You just recently relinquished that. The, chair, the, the mayor can be the chair of the board. I, I would. I'll see what happens when when the time comes. But I, I certainly would consider being the chair of the police board again. Yeah, sure. Because I think the budget, as you know, the budgeting process has to start with the police board, and then council says yes or no, and they can go through this back and forth. Um, how would you bring uh, other councillors, uh, the future council members, on side? Being, uh, if they're budget conscious, because of course uh, the police budget is a huge part of the city budget, and I know you're you're also running on keeping taxes low. Can you score those two? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, to me, the problem, budgetarily speaking, has been wasting money, and so we need to prioritize what is important to the citizens of Hamilton, and find the budget that that will work for that. But we have so many costs, like the $26 million we're spending. How about consultants? The number of consultants that we hire or have been used in the past would easily accommodate several new members of the police force. So why are so many city departments leaning on outside consulting to do the job that they're paid to do? So that's just one example of how you can examine the budget and find ways to do the things that need to be done without excessively, you know, nobody's going to freeze any budget. You, you never get to that, but that, that's what I think. I think Kevin asked this, I'll ask again. I think, I feel like the nine-year plan that you mentioned, and maybe you know this from talking to Chief Burden, uh, doesn't it deal with 12 officers a year? I think around there, 12, 13, I can't remember which. Would you like to go beyond that marker that Chief Bergen and his staff have suggested? Chief Bergen is the expert, not Bob Bratina. But I've been on the police board. I, I know the issues, especially service ratios. We're well below national averages, international suggestions of how policing should be done. So so I'll, I'll lean on the experts on that one. And just uh, why are we at this particular trail crossing here? Well, one of the things I mentioned in my remarks was the, the sudden uh, dangerous feeling of the people using the trails, especially in the evening. So we uh, are standing here by this trail, which is also located near a residential area, uh, where people may feel that there, there needs to be light here. Kids, of course, will be out playing, and then the sun always sets far too quickly. I can remember my mother yelling down the street to come home, it's dark. 
but uh, certainly a lighting along this trail would, would help alleviate some of those fears and concerns. But right now, you've you've heard very clearly and you've covered stories in the, in your newspaper about the fear that especially women have being alone on these trails. You know, just like this, how do you put you know, lighting on here, lighting on the trail trail? That's, that's going to cost money and a lot of effort to do that. How do you do Cost, that? The costs are coming down. You know, I've got a thing in my backyard. I get them at Dollarama for two ninety nine. I'm not suggesting uh, that that's the type of lighting that's going to support this, but the cost of lighting has come down, and we have to consider it. People are, are insisting on it. And even uh, we've heard this discussion about whether the, there should have been more lighting on the Red Hill Valley Parkway and the inquiry that's going on. Lighting is a key part of, uh, of a secure city. And, and so we, we have to get professional people, knowledgeable people to look and see how we can best do this effectively. Because just putting lights all over the place may not be the answer, but, but targeted areas would certainly be an answer. And you've mentioned, um, you know, uh, how some communities, Winona, for instance, there's places in Ancaster, break-ins, and uh, the cars and the houses, and they're, they're fed up. You know, they don't feel trusted or that the city can care for them. I mean, how do you address that? How do you provide that, you know, trust and assurances that that will happen? It's, it's a real problem for uh, a police force uh, dealing with the large area that we have. I mean, it's there are a few cities like like Hamilton with the area that we have, with the very rural parts of it. You know, in the Carlisles and Carlukes and uh, beyond Binbrook and, and 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 so on. So we have to figure out how to do it, and that's the job of the chief of police. But does he have the resources, chief? You should do this. Well, I can't because of that. And people have to understand in this day and age, the way the world is going. You know, I, I hate to be like that, but we need to do more to make people feel safe in their city. And I don't know how we can even attract uh, new businesses. If people are, if they're going to bring their employees to Hamilton, find a, an affordable place to work, uh, but also feel safe as well. Because, you know, I've heard, uh, for instance, uh, Jason Kenney the other day had a major press conference in Toronto about what a great city Calgary is, and it's safe, and it's affordable, and it's this and that. And I don't see why we can't move toward the same objective. I'd, I'd like to make the same speech in Calgary about bringing people to Hamilton, but we're not going to do it unless we put everything in place. And one of the most important things in place is the safety and security of our city. I think, in, you know, just to, to generalize, I think in past years, sort of the you know, between the police and the city council, uh, they've sort of wrangled over percentages, hikes of like four to five percent around there, and gone back and forth. What would be an acceptable uh, percentage hike on a police budget in any given year for you? I, I, I couldn't possibly re respond to that. You have to sit down and look over the, the universal budget and figure out what is the percentage. Where are we at? Where could we be? Where where are the the leaks? Where where is money being wasted? And any auditor will be happy to do a job on that one and tell you where you wasted millions and millions of dollars. I could do it off the top of my head, but we'll we'll wait for a later opportunity to do that. But that, that's what you do. You, I'm not going to say they need X percent. I'm going to say this is what we need to have a safe city. How do we achieve it? And council has to think carefully about that because there was there was some acrimony, personal acrimony, between some members of the police board and some members of the council that wasn't helpful to the city generally. And I regretted it at the time. During your tenure? Yeah, yeah. Yep. Police had, you mentioned community policing. Police had community policing Offices, outlooks, and Dundas up in the mountain, and I think it's still retreat, they're gone. I mean, you want them to, uh, I assume, you want them to be returned or at least have be in the community. I'm not sure whether bricks and mortar uh, is the answer to community policing 
or the, the way the patrols are established. But what people want to see is the, the vehicle and an officer or two, and maybe even the horses. You know, uh, I mean, that's a very controversial at times budgetary item. But it's certainly, whenever I see the horses among people, especially children, there seems to be a, a pretty good feeling around it. That's another thing that we'd probably have to look at. But at this point, I'm, I'm not in favor of eliminating uh, the, uh, the horses out of the force, but I am in favor of looking at everything to see where we, how we're going to get to where we need to be. Sort of a, a different approach to what you're talking about. Would you, would you be in favor of increasing funding, for, for example, for sort of these multidisciplinary teams like Social Navigator, uh, the, uh, those kinds of responses with, where you have a paramedic or a mental health worker? There's no question. We have to change the way we do things, and we have been changing the way we do things. But, and in, in, in spite of the need for a growth of that, at 3 o'clock in the morning, a call will go out and a police officer will be responding. Uh, so uh, that has to be considered as, as part of the whole. And, and I certainly am in, in favor of adding to those resources. But the whole issue of uh, the safety of our community, a lot of it, for instance, relates to the drug use right now. And do you know where drug use starts? If you look at the factors that affect drugs, it happens during school years. And, and we know that most kids can tell you that there, there have been drugs or they know they're aware of drugs right within the schools itself. So there's a lot more that we need to do to engage before the addiction process becomes to the point which it, it now is, which is, is terrible. And, and I'm not sure how much we're doing on that right now, but I certainly think that a lot of prevention could go a long way to solving some of the crime that we're experiencing. Okay? All right, thanks, Bob. Thank you. Thank you, Rain, first time.